what we tend to do is try to clean up what we're thinking, act right, get in some sort of uh, attitude of prayer. And that hurts us, that hurts us so badly because we tend to want to get everything figured out so we can walk with Jesus. And he wants us to walk with him so we can figure things out. We are meeting today with Shelley Rushing Tomlinson, who has just written a new Bible study called Seizing the Good Life. And Shelley wants to help readers grab hold of the peace and joy that she has found in the book of John, but she's done it in a really fun way. So Shelley, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and how did this book come to be in the format that you chose? Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate just being here and being able to talk about seizing the good life. The about me part, we can just make that super short so that we could have fun talking about Jesus. I am just a Jesus loving grandmother that lives in Lake Providence, Louisiana. That's the northeast corner of the state. I'm a Bible teacher and author but um, big family. I have two kids and grown children and grown grandchildren. Well, my grandchildren are about grown too now. They're all growing up except for the littlest one. But I'm just a farmer's wife and I live a simple life here, but I have the blessing, Billy Joe, of getting to travel the country and talking to people about Jesus and then coming back to my little bitty town on the little bitty lake and just having this uh, simple rural life. So I say I have the best of both worlds there. But you asked me how John came to be. Is that the question on the table before I begin rambling? (laughs) So, okay. So John came to be because are the seizing the good life, which is the title of this study on John's gospel. I have been long in love with John's gospel. It's just been a place that I love to see in new believers when someone says, our new Bible um, study, you know, people that like, I want to study the word. I don't know how I always send people to John because it's just such a beautiful book. But I decided that I felt like Holy Spirit was pressing on me to begin writing this study when I just, I sensed, well, it's not hard to sense because it's very obvious in our world, but there is just such a lack, even in the church of people having the peace and joy that is their inheritance in Christ Jesus, you know, because our world is just so tumultuous and um, so angry and dark. And so I just wanted to help people find out that the Jesus that they believe in is with them to help them, to strengthen their faith and to come alongside them. So I just take John apart and we just walk through John together. It's in a very interesting uh, format. I agree. (laughs) Shall I tell them about the format? I think you should tell them about the format because it is just so fun. Okay. So when I began writing this, when I proposed it first to my agent, he was going to shop the book. He jokingly told me, I think you have created a new genre here. I can't figure out where it fits. And I agreed with him. And it's because John is set up. There are 21 chapters in the book of John. So my study is set up with each chapter on John has three different sections. The first one is Dear John. And it's just where I write this very informal letter to John and just chat with him about, you know, what I'm seeing in that chapter. It's not an Anyway, I I always like to say this meant to be a seance or anything goofy like that. That is not biblical. I do not stand behind any of that. All it is meant to be, Billy Joe, is just us being able to see what it was like when Jesus broke into John's world so that we can understand what it's like when, you know, Jesus comes into our world and, and sets up, you know, camp with us and dwells with us. And so the second section is Dear Reader. And that's where I actually unpack. It's the Bible teaching part where I unpack the study that's involved in that one chapter. And we just kind of go through it and and see, you know, what the Lord is saying to us that can strengthen our faith and encourage us in that chapter. And then Dear Jesus is a prayer that I have penned to help all of us that have read that material in that chapter, just plan it and implement it in our hearts and ask Jesus to help us 
um, you know, live by what we just learned. So dear John, dear reader, dear Jesus is in every chapter. I so enjoyed that when I first looked at the book. I had the chance to read a quote from you that just uh, kind of captured my heart. So I want to read it for our listeners and have you talk about this. John's gospel has given me a glorious conviction of how present and willing Jesus is to help believers keep believing. This truth is critically important in helping us navigate life in our angry post-Christian culture. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's your heartbeat? I sure can. You know, I don't even like hearing post-Christian culture. None of us do. It's so, it's just a sad word and phrase in itself, but it just simply means that the world is no longer, um, they, they're, it, I, what we believe is not impacting the world, I should say. It, it, there was a time when the church and the community you know, really kind of set the tone. And now that that's just no longer this, the, the case. And our world is dark and angry. And oftentimes as believers, we often live under this kind of, even if it's not intentional, I'm trying to figure out exactly how to phrase this. We live under this idea that, you know, Jesus saved us and then it's up to us to pull up our bootstraps and get this thing done and have the right attitude and live the right faith. And it's very much of a, I will, I can, I'm going, you know, the little engine that could all over again. And we're not meant to be the little engine that could. And when we realize that Jesus knows our limits he knows what we're capable of. We cannot do this thing without him. That's why he came to live in us and strengthen us and walk with us. And we're not supposed to do it on our own. The, the strength of every believer is realizing that Jesus is our greatest need. Once we get that, you know, that we didn't need Jesus when we were only when we were saved. We need Jesus to walk out this salvation. And when we begin to really get that and we begin to rely on him, then we put that together with the gospel of John, where John shows this, this glorious, glorious picture of Jesus walking alongside the disciples while they tried to figure out what it was that he was about and what he wanted from them, which meets me and you, Billy Joe, right where we are, right? What do you want from me? Who are you? What do you want from me? And what we begin to see is that Jesus did it. He saved his, um, his irritation, his harsh words for those who were opposing the gospel. But for those who wanted to learn, who were like us, stumbling, bumbling, trying to move forward in this life of faith, which is where we meet the, the disciples. For these, he is right there actively encouraging their faith. And he will tell them something over and over that began to get my attention years ago. He will say, I'm telling you this so that you will believe. And we're looking at the word and he's talking to the big 12. I mean, they're supposed to believe, right? But what he's saying is, I realize it's hard. I know that, you know, you come to faith and then things rock you and shake you. And I'm here to help you keep believing. So Jesus would know what was coming down the path. And he would tell the guys, I'm telling you this so that you will believe. And then another thing that he did for people who already believed is he would rephrase an answer. He would be teaching and John will say, but we didn't understand what he was saying. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, but John would say, but we didn't get it type of thing. And instead of Jesus reacting like we expect people to, well, I told you once, I'm not telling you again, you know, and just, you know, begin teaching something else. Instead, Jesus, I mean, John would record that, that when they didn't understand, Jesus said this. So what Jesus would say next would be kind of, you know, a different, uh, uh, just another layer of his teaching. And it shows us that he is so patient with us when we want to understand and we want to grow and we're reaching for him. He's right here with us, helping us. Absolutely. Oh, I love that he's so kind to us slow learners. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We sure do need that, or at least I do. All right. 
So Shelly, would you like to give us a glimpse of some of the tangible ways that God has woven this Bible study message into your life? You know, maybe help listeners glimpse how this truth actually works out in the, the details of farm life or traveling or whatever they might be facing. Oh, I would love to. I so welcome that. This entire book, this study on John's gospel is just asking us to just run home to Jesus all day long, every time that, you know, with everything, what we tend to do is go home to Jesus. And I'm using that in the, um, by means of that, what I'm saying is in, in prayer. Okay. When, you know, turning our hearts to Jesus, beholding him, we tend to do that like these regimented little soldiers, you know, we go home to Jesus in the morning, we read our Bible study, we pray or whatever that, you know, we, whatever time that we have that we give to that. And then we soldier into the day, right? Trying to do all the things that we know we were supposed to do. We read it in the book. So we're soldiering into the day. And what I'm encouraging people to do is, is um, help them understand practically how to live in him the rest of the day, how not to walk in out of prayer, but walk in prayer. You know, you, you pray and then you just walk in prayer throughout the day. And so I use it often with the term run home to Jesus. And I began to, to teach on that as a way of helping people see when you're happy, run home, just Jesus. I mean, that's the best thing that just happened. Talk to him about what just happened. You're so happy about it. Run home when you're sad, when your heart's broken. You know, this is just crushing me. Talk to the Lord about it. You know, run home when life is crushing you. Run home when you're crushing it. You know, you're getting it all done right. Because what happens is we develop these soul restoring rhythms of our life where we're just going back and back and and a path begins to wear down between us and Jesus where we realize that there's really nowhere else we'd rather be and the most fascinating thing Billy Joe is that he has created us this way we can have our hands I'm not talking about being on your knees with your hands folded I'm saying he has created us where we can be in full speed doing a you know a thousand things here in the baby crying in the other room on the phone with a zoom call doing you know this and even as I'm talking to you I'm appealing to the Lord in my heart to help me express what he wants to he's he's given us that ability and we just need to learn how to live this life in him so I really I unpack that I think there's a version of that there's a thread of that in almost every chapter of this book where I'm just encouraging us of however present Jesus is and that has not been always hard for me can I say easy for me can I say something else <laughs> if I might um Okay, so that is not always easy because what we tend to do is try to clean up what we're thinking, act right, get in some sort of uh, attitude of prayer. And that hurts us. That hurts us so badly because we tend to want to get everything figured out so we can walk with Jesus. And he wants us to walk with him so we can figure things out. And we're so backwards. And so we'll want, we'll, we'll need him in the middle of the day, but we're, we don't feel close to him. He feels far away. And we don't know how to pray again because we're not in that little weird mood thing. I hope I'm making sense to someone, but you know, we're not in our devotional chair. You know what I'm saying? With our, our cup of coffee and so we're like oh I, I don't know how to get back to and he is the way maker and he made the way and so the way is always open so we just stop right there and we're like I'm just bringing you all my feelings all the stuff I'm just bringing you all the stuff because I need you and we have to we we get to learn those rhythms and we learn them by just doing it by just going back to him all through the day in our heart and leaving he left the door open but leaving the door open of our heart after we walk out of our designated prayer time I love that I think my favorite verse comes from Genesis when Jacob is running and he's sleeping on the uh, he's running for his life and he's sleeping on the stone and then we get to it's genesis 28 um surely god is in this place it, that journey of our faith life of learning that he's 
always right here. He right. didn't do devotions in the morning and then go on to the next thing. Yeah. We do that. So right. what a wonderful um, Bible study. So our next spot we were going to talk about is this world is nuts. And the devil has put a lot of lies in it. And it's crazy. And it's so easy to be deceived. How would you like to offer some tips from John about how do we fact check? This <laughs> Isn't that great? You know, there's so many fact checkers in the world. And the problem is we can't we can't trust the people that are checking the facts, right? You know, everyone has their set of facts. They're checking against someone else's set of facts. And we're left in the middle going, wait, what? But th actually, we are not. We are left with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I brought this out in Seizing the Good Life in the last chapter and it's a very familiar story in John 21, where um, Jesus is talking to Peter, right? And he's telling Peter that he is about to, um, I'm going to stop that. I'm sorry. He is telling Peter that and when he's older, he is going to be carried around. That's how he's going. You know, he's going to lift, reach out his hands towards someone and be carried around. Well, Peter turns around and he sees John behind him. And he knows Jesus loves John. I mean, we all know Jesus loves John. They apparently did too. And he's like, uh, uh, what about John? What about this one? And Jesus says to Peter, if I will that he is, you know, waits until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. John tells us something very interesting. He says, and so it went abroad. It was told that Jesus said Peter would never die. Yet, this is what John says that helps us understand how to fact check. To bring it to your, to your question, Billy Joe, John says that that's not actually what Jesus says. I mean, he's, re he's really pinning these words. It's so um, precious to me. John says, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, and then he goes on to, you know, pin Jesus's actual words. Well, what that's telling us is that John sent his readers back to what Jesus actually said to the word of God. That is our fact check. That is the reality. That is the truth. And in that story that we're given, those are believers that somehow got the story a little bit wrong. You know, when they retold that conversation, kind of like when we used to play telephone when we were little and, you know, you would all line up and you would tell someone something. And by the time it got all the way around the room, it was twisted. Well, that was Jesus and his, his 12 disciples. Well, minus Judas, that was Jesus and the guys right there. When that story kind of got, you know, twisted a little bit. That should be a warning to us that our, our fellow believers are well-meaning. They want the same thing we do, but they're not our fact checkers either. Because John doesn't say, you know, he doesn't repeat what any of the guys said in that moment. He sends them back to the source. And if we will live our lives going back to the source, to God's word, we can have discernment and we can check the facts of our crazy world. That is great advice. Have you um have you done other Bible study books or do you plan to do another book other than John? Yes, yes, I have. I have uh, two books out before this one that were well. This is actually my twelfth book. Um, that's another story. I've got humor books out and you know all these things. A, a cookbook out. Um, I just I love it all. But I have two other books out that are Bible study books before this one. They're Heart Wide Open and Finding Deep and Wide. And so they can find those um, easily as well if they Google my name, if our listeners, you know, wanted to do that. But I, I do think no one has asked me this question yet, Billy Joe. So this is just between me and you, right? No one's listening. I think... Um, Peter is going, I'm going to have to address Peter next because I so closely identify with Peter. I am very much jump out. Oh, wait, I'm in the water. I mean, that's me. That's how I live my life. So I'm probably going to address um, first and second Peter next. I can't wait. You and I have said that we, uh, we sense being kindred hearts. And I always joke that I want on my tombstone that Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Uh, 
So I'm very I'm, good to rush her. I'm going to have to be reading that. We will for um for listeners, we will have an author profile for you that has a link to your website. Yeah. So before we close this, though, are there any other nuggets of wisdom that you have that you want to help people live with peace and joy? Oh, I would love to answer that question. I was hoping you would give me that type of opportunity when we end, because this is just something that's on my heart. I say all the time, just don't pose with Jesus. Just don't, no posing with Jesus because he knows anyway, we cannot blow smoke with Jesus in our prayer closets. He'll call us out every time, you know, when we walk with him. So when we walk in full transparency with him, and so I want to give real verbs to that. What I mean by that is just, just saying, Lord, I don't like how I feel right now. Like I'm angry. I'm irritated. I'm agitated. Talk to him the way I would Billy Joe. I'm so frustrated by what happened instead of Lord, give me peace. You know, these words that we try to choose so that they sound good to Jesus. And I can see him. It's like in my heart, I can see him going, okay, just get to it. Like what is really bothering you, Shelly? And so oftentimes I've used an analogy of like, women understand, even if men don't, you know, that our purses are full. And sometimes we have to dump our whole purse out on the bed to see what it was, you know, this thing that we were looking for. And if we can just learn to live that way before Jesus, to realize that he's our greatest need and not pose with him and whatever is going on in our heart, he sees it. He already knows it. Just identify it, just own it before him and let him get to that, you know, that tender spot instead of all the the words, all the things that we try to surround it with. That is beautiful advice. Well, I hope that uh, the listeners have enjoyed this as much as I have. And I am excited to see, uh, see life change through your book. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And for all the listeners, y'all come see me. I love visiting with my readers. And so you can just find me online and come visit with me.